Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Melissa Pritchard, who's here to share with us her new book, Flight of the Wild Swan. So do you know the real story of Florence Nightingale's life? Well, today's guest is going to share with us just that. Melissa Pritchard has published eight award-winning books of fiction, a biography, and collections of essays. Among other prizes, she has received the University of Georgia's Flannery O'Connor Award, Chicago's Charles Sandburg Literary Award, and a Barnes & Noble Discover Great Writers Prize. A five-time winner of the Pushcart and O. Henry Prizes, and frequently shortlisted in Best American Short Stories, her fictions and essays appear in the Paris Review, Conjunctions, Echo Tone, Lit Mag, A Public Space, O. The Oprah Magazine, The Wilson Quarterly, and many other venues. So let's welcome to the show, Melissa Pritchard. Thank you, Marianne, and hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Have this conversation, have these moments, a moment. (laughs) (laughs) Well, do you know what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. So what even inspired you to write this? Well, um, I usually work from intuition and just a sense that I am destined to write something. It comes to me that there is some, uh, in my different books and stories that I've written, I get a, a, a physical feeling that, yes, you're supposed to work on this. And so I do. It's it's a very unusual feeling. But when I was in London in 2013 working on another book, uh, doing research for another book, I happened to see somewhere that there was a Florence Nightingale Museum at St. Thomas's Hospital. So I thought, my gosh, I've got to go to that because I've admired Florence Nightingale since I was a child and read some biography of her, hers. You know how they write these biographies for children to be inspired by great leaders or great great people of the world usually it was always men <laughs> but there was <laughs> but there was this Florence Nightingale and so I and I have a lot of doctors and nurses in my family and a great interest myself in healing and medicine and health so I said oh I'm going to go to the museum so I found my way there walked into this little dim lit museum I was the only person there except for the lady taking the tickets um and I was in there for I don't know I lost track of time you know, almost as if I entered another world of time. And I was just struck by everything I was seeing in her story, her clothing, the object she took to the Crimea, um, her stuffed owl that was a pet of hers, just everything in there. And then I stood in front of a portrait of a man I didn't know at the time, but we have become very familiar with, uh, Sidney Herbert. Um, And I stood in front of his engraving and I, I stood there and something happened to me physically. I just was rooted to the spot. And I said, they knew each other very well. There was a deep friendship. I don't know what it involved or anything, but, and the next thought was, I'm going to write a novel about this woman. And it was literally a visceral physical sensation of elation. And so I stayed a little while longer. And then I went in the little gift shop and I bought every book that they had (laughs) and staggered out with an armload of books about Florence Nightingale. And uh, I wasn't able to, it was five years before I could begin to read them back home in Arizona where I live, begin to read them and research. But I just, I just knew she was my, she was someone I was going to write about. Can you share with us a little bit about Florence's upbringing? Yes. She was born um, on May 12th um, in, in 1820. She was born in this, she's named Florence because she, her parents were on an extended honeymoon and and she was born in Florence, Italy. Uh, Her sister was born a year earlier in Naples and they didn't want to call her Naples. So they called her Parthenope, which is the Greek, old Greek name for Naples. And so she was born there and then she was raised in England at Leah Hurst in Derbyshire, one of her parents' estates, and also in Embley Park um, outside of London her parents' other enormous home. She was born to wealthy parents, well-connected parents, had an incredible education, unusual for a woman in those days. Her father had been to Cambridge. He was independently wealthy. He didn't really have a job, so he he dabbled. He was a gentleman. You know, he whatever interested him, interested him. And he decided to educate both his daughters. And 
Parthenope was, you know, more conventional in her interests, but Florence from an early age showed a brilliance, a precocity of intellect that was stunning even to her father, who encouraged her a particular, and so she studied the classics, Latin, Greek, she learned German, French, Italian, mathematics, philosophy, everything. She basically had the equivalent of a man's, a Cambridge man's education. That became a problem in a way because she was so brilliant, so quick-minded, so interested particularly in mathematics, gifted in mathematics, that then her, the fact that she was supposed to, as a young, wealthy woman, just get married and have children became a problem because that wasn't what she wanted at all. She wanted more of life and of herself. And she had a mystical experience at age 16 um, at Embley Park, the, the winter home outside London, where she was sitting between two cedar of Lebanon trees. They're still there. You can still go sit on the bench between the two trees. She had, God spoke to her is what she put in her journal, that God spoke, called to her, called her to his service. And she didn't really know what that service was to be, but it, she understood from the voice that she heard that it was to be a life of service to alleviate suffering of others. And it took her years really wandering in the desert, metaphorically, to realize that nursing was her calling and to hear God speak to her again when she was close to 30. Um, what I find interesting is that she didn't publicize this. She never wrote much about this to the public. Nobody knew about this deep spiritual dimension of her life um, until later, even posthumously. Uh, or in a, and on, among a few trusted friends, six or seven trusted friends, she didn't publicize it, which is probably a good thing because her religious beliefs were a bit heretical for the time. She was interested in Hinduism. She was, uh, she was interested in... in um, all sorts of comparative religions and had a, just a broad-minded approach to life. And she believed that work was a form of active prayer, purposeful work. Purposeful work in serving others was her form of active prayer. But she's highly educated. She was she was introduced to Queen Victoria, um, a sort of debut, debutante sort of thing, her sister first, and then she at the age of 19. Uh, Queen Victoria later went on to say later on of Florence when she was quite famous, oh, if I could only be Florence Nightingale instead of the Queen. And they were the two most influential women of the Victorian era, those two, Queen Victoria and Florence Nightingale. That's so impressive, you know, just comparing the two. And I can understand the Queen saying that because she's brought up in a way that she's expected to do certain things. And here we have Florence that is kind of blazing her own trail, which is really difficult at that time for women even, even to get an education. Yes, it was incredibly difficult for her. She she almost was on the, I was thinking about it today, that, you know, Joseph Campbell, the mythology, great mythologist, his The Hero's Journey, you've probably heard of that, you know, the call and the journey and the obstacles, overcoming adversity, bringing back home the gift, all of that. She really is a classical study, her life in The Hero's Journey, because she had to overcome so many obstacles. She had to overcome her parents when she announced that she wanted to study nursing, which at that time in the 1830s, mid-1800s, even into the late 1800s, was considered absolutely scandalous. Only the most, a, a woman who had nothing better, nothing else to do, of very low class, they were considered usually, well, Charles Dickens wrote a, a character sketch, Sari Gamp, in Martin Chuzzlewit, his novel, of the classic image of the nurse of that time, gin, gin soaked, gin addled, you know, no morals, just, be, you know, working in these hospitals were only, you know, if you got sick in that era, if you could, you got nursed at home, you didn't go into a hospital because hospitals were, had such terrible conditions. So for her to tell her parents, this highly educated, wealthy woman who traveled in aristocratic circles, or at least her family did, that I'm going to go be a nurse was nothing short of horrifying. Um, her mother, there, so her parents fought her for years and tried to forbade her from doing that. So she she suffered a lot uh, in that sense. Um, she had helpers, though. She had people who recognized her genius and her calling. Her aunt said she knew she was destined for great things. Um, she traveled with 
with older an older childless couple, longtime friends of the Nightingales, to Rome, and then to Egypt, and there she she met people who would be a, be great influences on her spiritually and politically. She had a number of experiences, so she had to overcome those obstacles. Also, just the world itself. It was a, the government was patriarchal and fairly misogynistic, and it was the height of the empire, the height of the British Empire. So women were just expected, especially of her class, they were expected to marry well. She was supposed to marry someone as wealthy as she was, have darling children, stay in the background, and she did anything but. She was a trailblazer, a pioneer, a visionary. Today we might call her a global humanist, a spiritual humanist, and a global visionary. So ahead of her time in her thinking, in her intellect, her spirituality, everything. We get her better today than they people did back then. So yeah, I the more I've studied her, it's been I've been living with Florence for six or seven years now, from research to finishing the book. And I just my awe of her. In, only increases and my eagerness to tell people about her. Well, and especially in the form that you've done as a historical fiction, it allows just this brilliance to come forth. And you're such an amazing writer. I and People are just loving this book and it's easy to see why. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Melissa Pritchard in regards to her new novel, Flight of the Wild Swan. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Are you a coffee lover who wants to make a difference? Look no further than Fire Department Coffee, a veteran-owned business that gives back to support first responders in need. Each batch of coffee is freshly roasted right here in the USA by a dedicated team of first responders and coffee experts. So when you enjoy a cup of Fire Department coffee, you're not only drinking high-quality coffee, you're supporting members of your community. Start your day with a coffee that gives back. Visit FireDepartmentCoffee.com. That's Fire, D-E-P-T, Coffee.com. Hey, pay attention, everybody. Amy Vaughn and myself, Dutch Mendenhall, are hosting an event. Have you ever felt like the wealthiest in America play by a different rule book? Even if you earn well, make money, invest wisely, educate yourself, there is an invisible barrier. It separates you from the financial security enjoyed by America's elite. The economic landscape changes every day. The wealthy elite know how to stay ahead of it because we play by a different rule book. At InvestWell Summit, we'll share all the plays and we're making it to win. Spots are going to sell out fast at InvestWell Summit. So get your butt to investwellsummit.com and secure your seat now. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Melissa Pritchard, who's here sharing with us her new fictionalized biography of Florence Nightingale, Flight of the Wild Swan. One of the things that really struck me is, I mean, women really didn't have a whole lot of rights. You're, you're right. They're, they're supposed to get married, marry well, have children, and that's it. So how did she survive? Was she given like a 
any type of allowance or anything? No, not at first. At first, she just, well, actually, she she really didn't have any allowance at all until I think it was in, um, oh, let's see, let me think. She went in 1850, so she would have been 30. She, her parents, her father, in fact, finally relented because she'd just been begging to go to these different hospitals, different places in Ireland and Paris and Kaiserwerth Hospital in Dusseldorf, uh, Germany please, can I go study nursing? And finally, after um, her, she went through periods of great depression and near suicidal tendencies, I think her father, who loved her, her parents loved her, they just didn't quite know what to do with her. They called her their, their wild swan in a family of ducklings. <laughs> but they tried to hold her back. But her father finally realized after this one incident that I write in the novel, we have got to let her go because she may not survive otherwise. Um, she was already 30, already a quote unquote old maid for those days and, and suffering depression. So he let her go to Kaiserwerth Hospital for first for two weeks, then for four months where she studied nursing with the deaconesses there, um, met these Protestant women in uni nursing uniforms, which is where she got the idea for her uniforms in nursing later on. Um, and she was never happier. She wrote her parents and said, I've never been happier in my life. And I'm even getting to do my own hair. Imagine that. She was brought up in such a way other people dressed her and did her hair. <laughs> I thought that struck me at a moment. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and she was very proud. She says, I do my own hair. I do everything myself. Uh, and she attended amputations and surgeries. And she just loved every minute of it. And she came home. And... Um, she wrote an 800-page religious treatise, theological treatise, and she also wrote a little essay called Cassandra. Basically, Virginia Woolf called it a scream, a feminist scream, you know, let me out. The way middle class and upper middle class Victorian women were imprisoned in their gilded cages. And then uh, after that, she did a little training in Paris, and she got a request to be a superintendent of a small hospital for distressed gentlewomen in London. And her father just, he saw he could not hold her back. It would destroy her. So he said, all right, she could take this job. And then he gave, to answer your point about money, he then gave her an allowance of 500 pounds a year. And on that, she could live. And she, she lived for the rest of her life, even though she came from a very, very wealthy family. She lived always very simply modestly i would say which impresses me too you know she could have had this some people would have loved to have had the life she could have had but she chose to follow what she felt god called her to do and that gave her the strength to so she didn't and she often used her money to buy supplies for others or gifts for you know books or whatever for her patients she wore sort of simple clothing almost like a uniform herself uh, but I want to say before people start thinking she's a somber, serious soul, which she was in some ways, very determined, very brilliant. She was also very funny. She had the ability to mimic people, particularly ones she didn't like very much in private with her sister. You know, nothing, <laughs> nothing hurtful. But she, I guess she was extremely funny that way. And I've, I read so much of her correspondence and she had a wit, you know, she did. And she loved animals. She always had animals. And near the end later years in her life, she had up to 14 cats. Um, she loved cats, Persian cats. And you can, in the in her papers in the British Library, you can sometimes see the paw prints. You know how cats like to get on top of your papers? You can see, you can, and she'd write from her bed because she was so ill. And they would, there are little paw prints on her papers that you can see, which is sweet. But yeah, so her father was the one. I credit him I have a scene in the novel where she's so angry with him. She says, why did you educate me? Why did you give me all this education and then give me a big head and then expect me to just sit home and, and do nothing? I can't live like that. So I think he began to realize, take responsibility, and, and he loved her. so. And the mother, too, she she let go and said, I guess, you're, <laughs> I, guess you're, I have to think of you as a young man, you know, rather than my what I wanted you to be. And parents, I think all parents can identify with that. We want our children to be a certain way. We have this idea 
Uh, and then they say, no, I'm not interested. I don't want to be a ballet dancer <laughs> or something, you know. No. So we all have to come to that place and allow our children to fulfill their destinies. But it took Florence, it was up until she was 30, uh, three to be free as she says to be free as any man with her allowance wow Uh and i mean so much that we take for granted now i mean we look back and it's it's just amazing how how women had to just survive in the world in many ways it was very difficult in those days you couldn't a woman could not vote could not own property i think if you were if your husband died, you could own the property. That was a little window. But otherwise, no property, no voting rights. Really couldn't, you couldn't speak in parliament. You couldn't run for office. I mean, women were expected to be in the background raising children. And part of the reason Florence was mythologized into the, sentimentalized into the lady with the lamp, the sweet, Vict- she was made the Victorian emblem of sweet womanhood to fit the times, you know, to fit the times and also to cover up the corruption that was going on in the Crimea, in the army hospitals and administration and stuff. So they they distracted from that by making her this really lovely embodiment of Victorian womanhood and softened her. Def- as someone once said, yes, they defanged her. And I said, yes, they did defang her. Uh, but so part of my interest in researching her was un- as giving her fangs back, like seeing how strong she was, how smart she was and how absolutely determined to to alleviate suffering in the world through nursing and the study of statistics she did so much in her life beyond nursing she was she didn't really nurse that long she started the school of nursing but she did so many she was a brilliant statistician numbers she said numbers were the measure of god she loved numbers she believed in science for her there was no co- this fascinates me that for her, there was absolutely no conflict between science and spirituality. They were one and the same. They were they reflected one another. She said, you know, God has laws. It's our responsibility to learn the laws that are reflected in nature and in science, and then to to live them out each in our own way with our own purpose, and to in that way to uplift humanity and harmonize with God's divine intelligence and alleviate suffering. I mean, it, it was amazing what she set out to do and what she accomplished, even being ill the second half of her life and bedridden. That's another thing. Another obstacle was her illness. And, and you know, it's interesting. She sounds like such a brilliant mind. She sounds in that league of the Albert Einsteins and, you know, th- those type of people that have come here, you know, they, they basically show up and they're changing <laughs> humanity. <laughs> Yes, she was absolutely a change maker, you know, I, there are different terms for it, but I feel like she she blazed onto the planet, you know, and was given this time period to do these tremendous things that she accomplished. Um, she did found a school of nursing for a professional secular school for women, never been done before. She After she came back from the Crimea, she got really interested in sanitation and hygiene she realized and ventilation and clean air she realized these things were absolutely essential to health diet a lot of the things we take for granted today in this sort of quote unquote new age you know mind body connection color therapy all these things she was already into all that she didn't call it by those things that we call it by but it's the same thing and then she also did uh some other things that aren't as well recognized her work in the field of statistics she was inducted into the Royal first woman inducted to the Royal Statistical Society, London. Um, she worked to get nurse trained nurses and midwives into all all the workhouses in the UK. Workhouses were these terrible places for impoverished people to go who had no money. And before Nightingale uh, enacted these changes. If you were sick in a workhouse, another person in the workhouse took care of you. Nobody had any training. Or if you had to give birth, somebody else helped you. There was no training. There was no medicine. There was no help. So she made sure that these poor people would get the training, trained nurses and midwives that they needed. She was always on the side of the poor, always on the side of the um, of women. Incredible. Even prostitutes, you know, when they were trying to enact these laws that were pretty brutal, 
uh, a prostitute. She's, she had nursed a number of young prostitutes in Middlesex Hospital during the cholera epidemic in 1853. And I mean, she went right in fearlessly. You know, cholera is very contagious and nursed these different young, impoverished prostitutes, girls, sometimes 12, 13, 14 years old. And they died, of course, and she's she experienced that too. And and so she she blamed society for their condition. She said, it's not their fault, society that has put these young women in these terrible places of desperation. She just had such a liberal, far-seeking mind. Even the even she didn't go to church for a while because she said, <laughs> and I found myself agreeing with her in so many ways. I was like, yes, but she didn't, you know, she had brought up been brought up in the uh, Unitarian Church and also Anglican. And she was religious, but after a time, she didn't go to church for a while, for a long while, because she said, I believe, basically, if I'm paraphrasing, my work is my church, is my worship, to help people in the ways that I'm helping them. Uh, later on, she went back to church again, but it was not... She, she resisted the dogma. She said it was too easy for people to just go to church on Sunday in their fancy dress and bonnets and pray, wrote prayers and say hello to everybody and go home and be the, exactly the same people. She wanted change. She wanted transformation of society to better society. Uh, she wanted divine intelligence to shine through society in the form of individuals with purpose. Pretty amazing woman. She definitely is. How was she met with with like bureaucrats or the British medical officers? How did they treat her? Well, in Rome, when she went to Rome, when she was in her late 20s, she met Sidney Herbert. She was introduced to Sidney Herbert and his wife. They were newly married on their honeymoon. And he became, he was slated to become prime minister eventually. I mean, he's a very well-connected political figure. He en ended up being the secretary of war. Uh, during the Crimean War, and they had become good friends. He knew all about her drive to be a nurse, to transform, you know, transform the uh, profession of nursing, and she was designing hospitals, and, you know, he knew, they became good friends, and he knew all about her, her drive and her ambitions. And so when there was an article in the News London Times by a journalist writing from the Crimean War about these terrible conditions, the soldiers in the Scutari Hospital, many dying not of battle wounds, but of the ter terrible conditions there. He wrote to her saying, would you like to take a small contingent of nurses over and be the first women, British women nurses ever to work with the military? It was funny because when he was writing her, she was writing him having read that article in the Times and saying, may I go? <laughs> I would like to go. So their letters kind of crossed. And within a short time, she had 38 nurses picked out kind of hastily. And off they went to the Crimea. So Sidney Herbert was her advocate. But then she got there and encountered so much resistance from the army, from the administrative, the bureaucracy, from the purveyor, the one who provided the supplies. They didn't want these women there. Even though the French, who were fighting the same war against Russia, they had their women nurses. England had never had women nurses in wartime before. So there was a lot of resistance. But what happened was there were a couple of terrible battles. Thousands of soldiers were suddenly poor, being carried into this, this hospital where she was. And the few doctors and the very few orderlies untrained, they were overrun. They couldn't cope. And so they had to ask the nurses for help. They were forced to ask the nurses, which they did. And grudgingly, everyone was so, these men were so impressed by Nightingale, by her, her, she had a genius also for administration. It's not a word we're fond of, administration, but it's necessary. And she was incredibly well organized. So within a short time, she had that hospital ship shape. She brought in the sanitarian, sanitary commission from England. She had a French chef who came over. She just had amazing things happening in a short time. And they all started to see you know, the officers and the, and the bureaucrats over there. Now, the people who, the men who really worshipped her there were the ordinary soldiers, not the officers who could often buy their way into their titles, but the common foot soldier, many of whom were Irish, many of whom didn't even, this only spoke Gaelic and had just been bought for a shilling and a pint of beer. 
promise and put in a fancy uniform. They were cannon fodder, basically. And they adored her because they knew she really cared about them. And she called them her boys. She always called them her boys. And she would, you know, the story of her going up and down the halls at night with a lamp. It's actually true. She did that. Recently, I just learned this last week, actually, that she didn't carry her own lamp. And it was a Turkish lamp, not the pretty genie lamp that you see sometimes. It was a Turkish wax cylinder lamp. She had an assistant carry it for her so that she could take her notebook and write down with each patient anything he needed or a letter home to the parents, anything she could do for that person. But she would walk miles every night in the in the dark with a candle, making sure they were all well. And so that's how another way the rep, her reputation as an angel, angel of the Crimea, floating by. There are lovely descriptions of her. And they would all look up and see her go by. And they were so devoted to her, rank and file soldiers. But and eventually the officers won over. And then when they saw how popular she was becoming over back home, when they saw the effect that she was having, the angel of the Crimea, you know, the mother of the soldiers, uh, they kind of went, well, okay. Grudgingly, they began to admire her. And then when she got home, she spent the next, let's see, she was 36 when she got home. She spent the next 50 years working. I didn't write much about that because it's not very dramatic for a novel, <laughs> but she spent the next 50 years, many of them in bed with brucellosis, crippled with brucellosis, where she was in such pain she would have to be carried from room to room. But she did tremendous amounts of work. She wrote 14,000 letters, published 200 pamphlets, articles, and books, um, ceaseless working with all her cats around her, and to, to reform the army, hospitals, then the British health system. She's really the... Pre precursor to the um, NHS, National Health Service. Her idea is that health care should be available to everyone, no matter your income, no matter your position in society. Anyone should be able to get health care. You see how radical she was. So she spent her life, the rest of her life, working for, for, the, for other people, and people adored her for it. And she had men, her close men advocates from Parliament, speak for her in Parliament because a woman could not speak in Parliament. But they would give her her speeches for her, especially Sidney Herbert did, to, to the end of his life. He only lived to be 56. She lived to be 90, but they worked closely together, and he was one of her greatest advocates. So she, you know, some people have accused her of being elitist or whatever, but I say she used that. She used her well, the, her position that she was born into, all the people in high positions she was introduced to by her parents. Uh, then when she, everybody that she met, she was comfortable in those realms, and she strategized and used not only her her celebrity, which she didn't care for. I think there's only, there aren't very many photographs or drawings of Florence. She didn't like her picture taken. She loathed it. She said it distracts from the work. It's not about me. It's about the work. She just had so many people. She wasn't intimidated. She She would just dive in there and get people to work for her and help her and and carry out her visions and and believe in them. It's remarkable for a woman of that time. She was the second most influential woman of the Victorian era completely. My goodness, you bring such a refreshing view in regards to Florence Nightingale. I just love the book Flight of the Wild Swan. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Ah, thank you. I would love that. I have a website. It's www.melissapritchard.com. I would love to reach out to book clubs. I love to I love to speak to people about Florence and about the novel. Of all the books I've written, this is the one I most feel almost like like zealous about. Like I really want to share her story because I think it's so inspiring. Well, my goodness, Melissa, it's been such an honor to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. I'm absolutely honored, and I've discovered your your show. And I, as I said earlier, before we got went on the air, that I've already been listening to episodes and scrolling through, going, "Oh, I have to hear that one and that one." Well, thank you, Melissa. It has been such an honor. Make sure to pick up your copy of Flight of the Wild Swan, available everywhere books are sold and visit Melissa's website at melissapritchard.com. To learn more about this book and all of her other writings, and of course, if you are in a book club, make sure to put this on your roster. Well, we're at the end of our time today. 
I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.